Well, welcome to Focus Today. I'm your host, Perry Atkinson, and uh, nice to have back in the studio with us, uh, Patrick Doyle, heads up Veritas Counseling. And uh, today we'll be talking about, well, something that uh, I think we all struggle with, guilt, shame, or freedom. Right? Yeah. By the way, if you want to join the conversation, we welcome you to do that. Our new phone number is 776-5770. Now, that's the number to get through to go on the air to talk to Patrick. It's a, it's a different number than our normal number. It's 541-776-5770. And if you want to do, uh, talk to Patrick, you can do that. And if you want to remain anonymous, we'll certainly respect that request as well. Mm. All right. Guilt, shame, and freedom. Yeah. Now. You've been with me enough to know, or at least I know, <laughs> that guilt's not of the Lord yep. and shame is not of the Lord. That's right. I but also, they are emotions. Yes. I'll throw a couple more in there. Yeah. Um, fear or conviction. Well, isn't conviction part of the work of the Holy Spirit? That's what I believe. Absolutely. Okay. But you'd be, you'd be surprised, at least in my experience, uh, with the number of people that I sit with who are feeling shame and guilt and calling it conviction. Oh. And if you're feeling shame and guilt, I can guarantee you that um, you're not gonna have peace. Freedom won't be a part of what's going on for you. And um, I strongly believe that uh, God does not use conviction, I mean, uh, shame or guilt or fear as a motivator for his children. Now the church might, or organizations might, or your friends might, or your parents might. Yeah. <laughs> but God doesn't use those things to motivate. He said, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit for two reasons. To convict you of sin, what's right, what's wrong. I believe embedded in that conviction is the revelation of what's true, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just about what's wrong. It's also about what's right. So you can kind of know that. And, you know, as, as you grow in your understanding of who God is, you, st you start to change because you know what the right thing is. Mm -hmm. it, it's not something we know instantaneously. We know as we go, right? Know as you go. So um, that conviction is one of the reasons why God, one of the things that God said the Spirit's job was is to, to bring about conviction. The other was to bring about comfort. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, a little side note, but, you know, uh, in the church, we talk a lot about um, fruits of the Spirit, right? Uh, and I have Love, joy, peace. Yeah, right. Self-control, all those. Yeah, and I can tell you that from my experience in counseling, that there are a lot of people that I've dealt with who are good at faking the fruit of the spirit. You know, I uh, I would say there was a time in my life I disagree with you, but not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you live long enough. Well, it's amazing who comes to your office <laughs> and what their story is. Exactly. So, yeah. and I've seen a lot of harm done by people who have a veneer of the fruit of the Spirit and people give them the benefit of the doubt because they think that they have all of that together. <clears throat> and then later you find out it wasn't even true. Mm -hmm. Okay, So here's something I would say. I'll, I'll tell you something you cannot fake. Okay. You cannot fake conviction. Uh. The scripture says that godly sorrow, conviction, right. leads to repentance, right. which is a change in who I am that God brings about. Okay. Something outside of myself. Right. Like I was a drug addict and God convicted me. And here I am all these years later, still not a drug, well, save coffee, still not a drug addict. <laughs> <Not good. clears throat> um, yeah. So <clears throat> it also goes on to say that worldly sorrow leads to death. Huh. Now, I'll tell you one of the main examples I used to describe worldly sorrow. Years ago, I had a guy in my office big Christian guy, you know, big reputation. Every, a lot of people knew him, you know, big, big, big man on campus, very Christian, <clears throat> has an affair on his wife and um, is found out to be lying about most of the things that he was saying he was when the truth came out. So we, we, he, they come to my office and it's, it's the confrontation time. And so we have the confrontation and yeah. he, he breaks down and he just starts sobbing bitterly. I mean, like begging for forgiveness and just very dramatic emotional intensity and, you know, <laughs> snot bubbles and the whole nine yards. And then he goes out and continues his behavior. So what did all that mean? Well, according to what you just said, that was a, that was a 
It was phony. It was phony. Exactly. Right. It was what the Bible calls worldly sorrow. It's not real. It's a it's a feigned reality. But it's really hard to not get fooled by it because at the moment I believe I believed what was going on at the moment. I saw all those repentant words and that behavior and I thought, wow, maybe something's really happening here. And this is what I tell people. Don't make your decision on what people say. No. Make your decision on what people do. Okay? Because what you do reveals what you really believe. Right. What you people yada 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 all day long and then go behave another way. So if I'm going to live in freedom, I have to live in conviction not guilt and shame. Now, how can I tell the difference between guilt and shame? There's a good one. Okay, so here's how I describe it. Guilt and shame uh, push me away from people, mm-hmm. push me away from God. I feel hopeless and worthless. Wow. All right, so it pushes you away from people. Push you away from people. Pushes you away from God. Pushes you away from God. And you have a sense of hopelessness. And, and you feel worthless. And, and with the guilt and shame is always some kind of internal or external accusation. The wagging finger. You should have. You didn't. Why not? You're not good enough. Look at you. How come? That kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. So conviction, on the other hand, is from God, not you. Okay. From God, not your friends, right. not your spouse. And the, the, re, the way I know it's God is it. Even though I might, like when I recognize how wrong I am, I might be in tremendous pain realizing how wrong I am. But in the midst of that, with conviction, I'm drawn toward God. I'm drawn toward other people. I'm going to go and confess my sin. I'm not going to hide and run away, right? I have a sense of value and I feel I, I, I don't feel um, worthless and I don't want to run away. I want to engage the exact opposite of what guilt and shame will do for you. If somebody is deep, deep in guilt and shame uh-huh. and they have <laughs> yeah. the sense of worthlessness, yes. outside of divine intervention, how do, do they have anything within them that could, that could get them to, to consider God? I think the best you could do is minimize some of the symptomology. But I don't think, apart from a spiritual healing, because at that level, I mean... So somebody praying for that person, they have to be praying for that conviction. Yes. Which is, yes. A, which is a divine thing. Yes. It's a supernatural yes. thing. Yes, absolutely. And I think the way, the role that we can play is that we can tell the truth in love. Not condemn, not blame, not shame, <laughs> not beat up, not accuse. We can tell the truth in love. And how would you do that if somebody's down and out without them thinking that you're just pounding so, on them? So, you know, Bill, Jane, um, I, I, I care about you, but I, I want to just tell you some things I notice. It seems like you're believing a bunch of stuff about yourself that's not really true. You, you know, and listen, the scripture says that Satan is the father of lies. Mm. And he's the accuser of the brethren. Of the brethren. And yeah. he uses lies to accuse. And I've said this before, but I think one of his greatest tricks, and I think lying is Satan's greatest power. Mm-hmm. If he can get you to believe a lie mm-hmm. about who you are, who's driving your boat? He is. Exactly. Yeah. And you see, you see that self-destructive cycle in lots of people, myself included, because of the lies that I believe. Now, when I'm a kid and my dad is beating me and telling me you're a worthless piece of junk, mm-hmm. oh, expletive, 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 <laughs> and you'll never amount to an expletive, expletive thing, mm-hmm. um, that's kind of hard to get away from. (laughs) It leaves an indelible mark. And so it gets back to this value question. If God is accusing you, displeased with you, waiting for you to get it together, are you going to want to go toward him? Yeah. No. No. So God is saying, look, as a result of what I've done for you in Christ, come on, I'll take care of you. But Many people I see, Perry, are full of shame and guilt. And they have reason to be because they've really blown it. I have reason to be because I've really blown it. No one is exempt. But the person who's in the middle of shame and guilt, isn't it somewhat compounded by thinking, well, uh, I'm worthless to God. I mean, I've blown yes. it with God. Yes. And see, there, there is the great spiritual lie. Okay. Satan wagging his finger. And this is what happens. So... I'm a, I'm a you know, person who's you know, been a Christian a long time, and here's what happens inside of my head. 
you know, uh, obviously God has revealed himself to me, changed me, done a lot of things through me. But in the dark night, when I'm stre stressed out, struggling, beating myself up, what Satan does is that he'll come to me and he'll say, he'll take one of those real events, like something I did, like let's say like I was an addict or when I was a porn addict, and he'll, he'll look at me and he'll say, he'll say, in my head, well, you think you're all that. What about that? Mm -hmm. And then he points to an actual event that I experienced, something I did or something that happened to me. And then it starts to feel like, that's real. I, that, I really did that. But the problem is, yes, that's a real event. And God knows. God knows about that event. Mm -hmm. The difference is God's not going, God's going, I took care of it, son. I will heal you. So it's really important that that internal language, what the counseling world calls self-talk, if it's if it's accusatory, you're going to end up in guilt and shame and fear. All right, we're going to take a break here. By the way, if you want to join the conversation, the phone number is 541-776-5770. Now, that's the number to get through to talk to Patrick on the air, okay? 5776-5770. I'm still learning it myself. <laughs> and uh, if you want to remain anonymous, we'll let you on the air without giving your name. And when we come back, I'm going to ask him, how do you know when somebody, how do you know when somebody doesn't realize that they're in worldly sorrow and That's not, true. they okay. think they're probably dealing with God, yeah. but they're really manipulated themselves into yeah. a lie. Does okay. that happen? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. We'll be right back <laughs> with Patrick Doyle. <laughs> Hi, I'm Paulina, and I work at the Deaf TV. Did you know that when you support the Deaf TV, you have a profound impact, not only in our community, but around the world? It's your continued support that takes the inspiration and hope in the programs we produce and makes them available to the thousands of people who are watching these videos online every week. Help bring encouragement and hope to our valley and beyond by making a secure online donation today at our website, thedove.us. Okay, we're back uh, with Patrick Doyle. Uh, he heads up Veritas Counseling, and we're talking about something I'm sure somewhere along the line you've dealt with, yeah. guilt and shame, and how do you turn that into freedom, which almost seems to be an oxymoron, but it's not. <laughs> it is possible with God. Mm -hmm. And um, if you want to join us or if you have any questions, concerns, you're welcome to do that. The phone number to get through to the air is 776-5770. And if you want to remain anonymous, um, we'll do that. Now, you were talking about Godly conviction and worldly sorrow, the, yes. the difference between the two. Yes. And I've done enough lay counseling to know that sometimes you just know you've been given a line. <laughs> yeah. And I've been in sessions where I might as well wore rubber boots in the room. I mean, it was so thick, you know. Save your watch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm just going, what? How do you plow through this? Yeah. But they're convinced. Yes. Yeah. And you're going to come in and say to them, that is baloney. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you Lovingly. do that in a Christian Lovingly, way? Lovingly. Yeah, yeah. How do you do that? Well, remember, um, one of the things that I think that we, ha we cannot forget that is that all of us coming to the truth is a process. Yes. I mean, yes. I'm still in the process. Yeah. I'll, I'll stay in the process until the day that I'm no longer here. So part of me has to remember I me. Mean, um, uh, I mean, I, earlier in my life, it was more of the angry young prophet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, rah! Okay, but as time went on, I realized, you know, that's not, that's not benefiting anyone. Uh, that's not, I'm wrong. It doesn't help them. So as, as God hu has humbled me and helped me to see, it's given me patience. Because the truth be told, I was the worst I was in as much denial. I was the worst denier that, you know, there ever was. And I can only imagine how the people around me felt, the guys that were mentoring me. Like one, you know, Steve is one of them. You know, um, he, you know, he had to deal with that with me. So it helps me have compassion. And if I don't have compassion, the, the, what I'll end up doing is getting into a, a battle. And if you start battling with somebody in denial, you never win because they don't play by the rules. But what if somebody <laughs> shut down? In other words... Uh, Earlier, you said that guilt and shame will mm -hmm. cause you to withdraw from yes. people, mm -hmm. certainly withdraw from God. Yeah. Yep. They become introverted with mm -hmm. such guilt and shame yeah. mm -hmm. that they, you, you can't seem to get through. You can't yeah. seem to poke a word in there mm -hmm. that would stick. Right. And so I, I, it's my belief that I don't think any person has the ability to figure that out and fix it. 
I think God may use you in a conversation. He may not. He may do it in the quietness of their own soul. He may do it while they listen to music. Who knows how he'll do it. But I think one of the things we have to do is get the pressure of fixing it off of ourselves. Listen, that's his business. I'll tell the truth in love and I'll be patient, but I'm letting him have the outcome instead of me thinking if I just said it right, it'd, br- it'd break them open. Uh, and listen, I have, a lot, yeah. I have plenty of experience to know that's not true. Uh, oh, I've learned that one. Yeah, and so, you know, as someone is is consumed with self-doubt, um, fear, uh, shame, guilt, is that person going to live in the freedom or in the love that God has so generously given us? Well, the answer is no, but no. they don't ever see God's freedom and love as to be something right. they'll ever obtain. Yeah, and so here's what I'm saying is that that's why I think, you know, one of the reasons why I bring this up is because as people, you know, in relationships, one of the things that I think really helps this process is other people being honest about what goes on inside of them. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, Bill or Jane, I understand what you're talking about. I've had that kind of self-doubt. I've really uh, mis- uh, felt like I was no good for nothing. And here's what helped me. Instead of, I'm okay. I don't have self-doubt. I'm always in, you know, my faith is intact always. I never, you know, have a bad day. When people... <laughs> When I'm around with somebody who's all together, I don't feel very good. Because mm. I know I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> no, the golden moment. I, I don't know. You, did you catch that? Well, I could say a big hearty amen to that. Yeah. And, I, am, I am amused by those who try to impress me. Yeah. And so listen, the last I checked, everyone's a sinner. The last I checked, everyone has yeah. failure. Yeah. The last I checked, everyone's weak. Including you and me. Yes. Yeah. Maybe me the worst. Yeah. Um, and so when, when, when I'm around somebody who's all together and have all the answers and they're just uh, you know, running through the diatribe of things I need to do, I'm just like, whatever. I don't want to hear it. Okay? So as, as friends, as brothers, as sisters, as husbands, as wives, whatever our relationship, be honest. You know, I struggle with that too. Here's, here's what... And so this is what the scripture says, is that we are, 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 what we have is a testimony, not a teaching. And somebody who's feeling overwhelmed, or devalued, doesn't need information. They, don't, they can't implement it anyway. They're like, whatever. So somebody who shares the load, if you will, the, the scripture says we're to bear each other's burdens. Well, you've got to know what the burden is enough to bear it. Mm-hmm. But we are so busy not getting down to that point looking good, being yeah. spiritual. I have to say, I really think this is a biggie in the church. We throw words and scriptures at it and yep. call that counseling and yeah. walk away. Yeah. I don't know if we really know what it is to pick up the other person's load and walk mm-hmm. with it for a while. Well, I can tell you this. Because, um, I mean, that really means effort, output, yes. and commitment. Yeah. Far beyond your schedule mm-hmm. and your knowledge. Generally speaking. Yeah. And it, it's going to cost you something. Yeah. And I can tell you that I can't, if I, if I had a dollar for every time I heard somebody say, yeah, and they were giving me scriptures and I wanted to poke their eyes out, yeah. you know, uh, because if somebody's suffering, the last thing they want you to do is sort of sermonize them. Yeah. They don't want you to give them the five steps of how to overcome this, or they don't want you to... Listen, somebody who's feeling worthless, feeling overwhelmed, feeling guilty, feeling shame, the last thing they need is more finger-wagging. All right, let's talk to the person who's feeling this today. Okay. In other words, it, who knows what the reason is? Yeah, it multiple. Could, and let me just say to our viewers and listeners, it could be multiple reasons. Oh, yeah. Usually but you, you're feeling the guilt and shame. Mm-hmm. Could be something you've done mm-hmm. or something who's bullied you into thinking. Yep. But you're trapped in this emotion. You just mm-hmm. can't seem mm-hmm. to rise above mm-hmm. this constant hammering mm-hmm. over your head. It's like mm-hmm. having your head under a paddle wheel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, bang, 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 <laughs> right, bang, bang, right, bang. Right. Uh, yeah. how, do you, how do you begin to help this person to look in another direction? Well, so there's uh, David in the Psalms. He says, when my soul is in the dumps. Now, what does he mean? What he means by soul is in the dumps, when he's depressed, when he's overwhelmed, when he feels like a piece of junk, when he's... Yeah. Now, I know if a lot of people would be surprised that David felt that way because of the way we characterize it. We don't really bring that stuff to the surface. But David was a crazy man. He was not a very good guy. Well, no, I mean, he, you know, adultery, murder. Yeah, broke big... all Ten Commandments yeah. just with the thing with Bathsheba and her husband. Yeah. And at the time... All of those under the law were punishable by death. 
Okay, so God had mercy on David. He, David wasn't a pristine, godly man. His son raped his daughter and his other son killed his other son. And you know, there's all kinds of trauma in this guy's family. And he's the doer of trauma. So when he says my soul is in the dumps, what do you think he's thinking about? Well, he's about as low as a snake belly. Yeah, and he's thinking about all the failure, all the things he should have done, all the things he could have done, what he didn't do. This is what happens, right? And, and, and the wagging fingers start coming out. And so David says, when my soul is in the dumps, I rehearse everything I know of you. Now, I don't know if you know this, but except for two or three or maybe four exceptions in the entire Bible, the word no means, when translated correctly, personal, intimate, relational knowledge. It doesn't mean no. Okay. It means no. Okay, so it's, it's heart, not head. Yes. Okay. So when David says, I rehearse everything I know of you, what he's saying is he rehearses everything he knows of God. Now, it's not no, uh, Romans 8, 28, and, uh, you know, yeah. John three sixteen, and, you know, yeah. <laughs> whatever. Uh, because I've done that, you know, quoted scriptures at things to no avail. Yeah. Uh, but here's what happens. I, there have been experiences in my life, Perry, where, where I know that I know that I know that I know that God has spoken to me, that he has helped me. And when I start thinking about those things, mm -hmm. or as David said, when I start rehearsing those things in my mind, now things start to change because I know that's true. If I don't know it to be true and I start thinking about it, how easily is that, oh, that, that objected to by all the lies inside of me? The lies inside of me have a lot of power have a lot of influence, they're strong. And so what I, what I say to people all the time is that most people haven't really gone back and looked at it. Mm -hmm. Most people haven't really thought about it. And the other thing I ask people to do is that, look, I strongly encourage you to write what I call as a book of remembrance. I want you to go back to the earliest memory where you know that in some way God intervened in your life, where he revealed himself to you, that you know, not anybody else, it's between you and him and you know that. And I want you to start documenting those things in as much detail as possible. And then at night when you're trying to go to sleep and your mind's on fire with what a piece of junk you are, mm -hmm. whip that open and start reading it. And like David, soon you'll be praising again. Mm -hmm. Soon you'll be over it. Because it's, it's battling the lie with the truth. But the truth cannot be ex external. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? A sermon. It has to be personal knowledge of who he is. And this is one of the tragedies, I think, of modern Christianity is we've become so didactic, so uh, sermonized, so uh, information-based. Uh, well, we certainly don't lack for teaching. <laughs> <laughs> but somehow... Understatement. <laughs> it just doesn't seem to be being applied. I mean, it's kind of like we have the itching ears. Mm -hmm. uh, we got all this stuff and we got all these great, but it doesn't translate. Well, what would you rather do? Go sit in a church, hear a great sermon, listen to great music, look really good, and then go home and not have to deal with it? Well, or would you rather be transformed by the power of God and the truth yeah. that he's revealed in a relational sense? Yeah. God's whole thing is relational. It's not academic. All right. Well, I tell you what you've, uh, we're going to take a break here, but I tell you what the other door you've opened up here is those of us who work with other people, people like yourself, yeah. counselors, you hear the stories, you hear, yeah. you put it all out there uh -huh. and you realize, wait a minute, the one thing that has to take place here is divine intervention. Yes. My role now is to move you in that direction. Yeah. And I, I can't do it, you can't no. do it, but you can open the door for yeah, it to happen. That's exactly right. All right, if you want to join us and uh, have any questions or comments and you're dealing with guilt, shame, um, and you want to turn that into freedom, uh, it's a wonderful thing, and it does happen. Yes. It happens every day in a big, big way, yeah. and it can happen to you. You can join us at 776-5770. Patrick Doyle, we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Paula, and I work at the Dove TV. Every day we get letters and emails from people who've been encouraged, blessed, and challenged by the programs on the Dove TV. But we couldn't do it without you. Did you know that more than 90% of our income comes from people like you? You can help us continue to bring inspiration and hope to our community by making a secure online donation at our website, thedove.us, or call us at 541-776-5368. Uh, 
Uh, welcome back with Patrick Dro. We perhaps should turn the mic on between the breaks. <laughs> <laughs> Some pretty raw discussion yeah. going on here. Or maybe not. <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll work on those okay, two things right. later. Okay. All right. Anyway, welcome back. Uh, we're talking about something that is quite serious. And I'm sure that there's a time in your life where you felt worthless. You know, this whole self-esteem thing, it can be, it can be real and it can be totally blown out of perspective. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, you and I have dealt a lot, and you more than I, that people who have low self-esteem, which I would mm -hmm. assume is a shame and guilt issue. Yes, definitely. So then your self-esteem or your self-worth falls right. down. Right. You think you're worthless. Yeah. You can't do anything. Mm -hmm. I haven't found one person in the Bible <laughs> that God used that was perfect. Yeah, save Jesus. That's the only one. Yeah. I mean, uh, but look at Rahab. Uh-huh. Saved the nation. Yeah. And she was a harlot. Yeah. Look at David. Yeah. I mean, you Solomon. Know. The look same, at Solomon. I the mean, look at these guys and you're going, and look at, look at even Paul, what oh. he was before he got knocked off his high horse. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, if there's ever a reason to think that God couldn't use you. It's just not yeah. the case. But see, the problem is, Perry, from my perspective, is we sanitize the Bible in when we tell those stories. We talk about how, what a great man of faith David was or what a man after God's own heart. You can't read his story and think that, if no. you're honest. That guy was a mess. And his son Solomon wasn't any better. Did God use him? Absolutely. But what that reveals is God's mercy and goodness. Yeah. It doesn't reveal how that David jumped through the hoops appropriately so God blessed him. Yeah. Which is the other thing um, that I am concerned about um, as it relates to guilt and shame. If you have a gospel that's built, uh, what I would call, if you have a gospel that's what I would call man-centered, it's about you, and it's about you getting to heaven, and it's about you feeling better, and it's about you having a better life, it's about you getting what you want you're gonna be sorely disappointed in the gospel because <laughs> that's not what it's about. The gospel is about God intervening in our, un, in our uh, inability to save ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so if it's a God moving into trouble, he's not surprised when he finds you there. <laughs> yeah. But if you think you have to like, sort of pick yourself up and do good so that he can love you, well, that's never gonna happen. And when you start talking about these things in the scriptures, it's, it's a train wreck from start to finish. It's a train wreck with humanity. And it, what it reveals is God's mercy and grace, not our goodness. And so that's one of the main lies I see with people is they got all the pressure on themselves. And I'm like, wait a minute, you can't do it. It's, yeah. You don't have the power, you're a sinner. You need help. And hey, God has mercifully come and said, I'll help you. Now, granted, he does it his own way in his own time, which sometimes makes me, makes me think he's not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are those dry moments. <clears throat> but he is, and so that lie of, of responsibility and self-reliance, I, I would say very clearly that self-reliance is, is the opposite of being godly. Mm. The, the, my position with God is that of dependence. I'm in need of him. That never changes. Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, uh, uh, Dr. David Jeremiah is on a series now, uh, Seven for Heaven. Mm -hmm. So the number of man is six. Yes. The number of the beast is 666. Yeah. Well, the best that anybody could do is get to that number, but it's not a seven. <laughs> <laughs> the difference between six and seven is the blood of Christ. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I don't care how well you do your thing. Yeah. You still need yeah. him right. to finish the completion of what you need to become. Right. You know, and you're not going to go to heaven on your own work. You're so, not going to get there by your own so tough turning around. No, but, but think about it. So here I am, Perry, in my, sa my shame and guilt, thinking I'm a worthless, no good for nothing piece of junk, mm -hmm. and I've failed and I'm never going to be able to get, do good enough and all that stuff. And then somebody comes along and says, you know, that God wants me to do better. <laughs> well, forget yeah. that. I, I I can't even do what I'm, you know, what I know I'm supposed to do. Right. So, it, it, you know, God's offer of hope is that he will give you power and strength and he will help you get through the difficulty. But most people see God as not interested in somebody who's that messed up. Yeah. And the truth be told, God already knows. One of the things, one of my favorite musicians has a line in one of his songs. He says, 
you know, in, in this song, he says, I'm of God. He says, I'm the one in your head listening to you scream. Mm. And that kind of intimate awareness is the truth of who God is. He knows what's going on. Yes, he has his own timing. And because we, it doesn't go our way, we misinterpret that as a lack of care. But I'm sitting here today, clearly the result of God's mercy. Not my goodness. <laughs> because I've been trying to get off the boat the whole time. <laughs> and he keeps in his mercy taking care of me. My instincts are to do my own thing. My instincts are to survive. I grew up in a survival home. I, I had to survive. So that's something that I always wrestle with. It's one of my first things. And the other thing that I want to tell people that I think guilt and shame gets on them is that you have ongoing issues. They don't go away. Mm. And then, then Satan comes around and says, see, you're not good enough. See, you're never going to get over that. See, you, you, see, see, see. Put you down, put you down, put you down. Listen, God was not surprised when he found out what my issues were. <laughs> mm -hmm. He knew all along. And so he has promised, God has promised, I will redeem whatever you do, whatever's been done to you, and I will redeem it consistently until the day that you come to heaven. And at that point, I'll make it all new. But you have that guarantee. Now, in my life as a kid, the only guarantee I had was pain. So for me to be submitted to somebody who has power was really hard for me because the power that I lived under was dangerous. And I hear a lot of people say this to me. Well, I don't know if I can trust God. Well, what if, God, if God's so good, then what about this? Well, if God loves me, then why this? And how come that? And mm -hmm. so they start to undermine his, his goodness and his character, which is the, really the goal of the liar, because if he can get you to undermine and not believe that, then what do you have? Yeah, nothing. You have your own yeah. self-will, yeah. which is not enough. Right. And so the cycle continues, which is why I believe us as brothers and sisters living more honestly with each other will help solve that. Because when you and I talk and you know, I tell you about my difficulties and you tell me about yours, I breathe a little easier like, okay. You know, I, Perry's not perfect, and, and I, I don't have to be perfect. And but yet, I think a lot of times we, we, we subtly or not so subtly, put that on people, which is you need to get your act together. Is legalism and judgmentalism yes. <laughs> a sign that you haven't really released yourself? I mean. Uh, it's amazing how many doctrinal police there are out there. <laughs> I confess to having been one. Okay, you know what I'm saying? Yes, absolutely. And that adds to the guilt and the shame. Yes. And they're very adamant about yes. it. And it could be a certain doctrinal position. Yes. And there's been denominations built on this yes. kind of stuff. I've argued it. And I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but my stars, if you don't live according to this, 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 and this, what you don't hear in that message, A, is grace. Yes. And the other thing you don't hear in that message is, is the very thing you're trying to talk about is right. having this intimate relationship. Yes. That intimate relationship is based upon this, this, and this, and this. Yes. I'm right. going, whoa, whoa. Yeah. And so when you no look, wonder people run away from the church. Exactly. When you look at the example of Jesus, how many theological debates did he have? Uh, zero. <laughs> <laughs> how, many the, how many political debates did he have? Zero. He didn't debate. He loved, okay? Now, what he was said was, is undeniable, right? Very clear. But, you know, he said over and over again, you know, for those who you have given ears and eyes to see, Father, let them see, let them hear. So who was in charge of people even understanding what he was saying? God. Not Jesus. No. Whatever you decide, Father. So he is our example of living in dependence. This is the God of the universe in, the, in flesh, Living in dependence? Yeah, it's a mystery. Of yeah, that, that that's thing. our example, though. Yeah. And we think we can do it independently of that? That's, that's just r ridiculous. What about relapse? People feel, and they, yeah. they start to make progress and then they relapse. You know, I've had Doug Guaranteed. Gould on here with Foundations for yeah. Recovery, and he'll say, yeah, we're going to walk you through the relapses, too, yeah. up to a point. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> you know. Right. I mean, you don't want the relapse to turn into your excuse. Yeah, exactly. But, I mean, it, it does happen. It does. And listen, that's, the whole, that's my whole point, is that it is a... Um, I, I hear people talk about the Christian life, and, and, and it, it, by listening to him, you'd think it was this nice, gentle bar graph into heaven. Right. This nice 
continued progress right into heaven. If you read the scripture, what you see is this. <laughs> there is no nice bar graph and it's one day as a victory and then one minute is not and then the next minute might be. It's all over the place. And so, but ultimately, what am I trusting in? Am I trusting in my ability to pull myself up on my bootstraps and do the right thing? Or am I trusting in God being merciful and gracious and loving? Uh, and so come, freedom me, is being loved. Let me come back to you. Okay. Uh, I better do that after the break. But here, let me ask you the question okay. you can brew on it. Okay. Uh, you came out of uh, a very difficult childhood. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> total abuse. Yeah. Physical, verbal, yeah. mental, yeah. spiritual. Uh-huh. Uh, into a life of addiction. Yeah. <laughs> from all kinds of things. Yeah. Um, what was it <laughs> that got you to say, okay, God, I can't do this? Okay. All right. I'll we'll take you. a break with uh, Patrick Drell right after this. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dan and I work at the Dove TV. You know, compared to Portland, Seattle, and L.A., Medford might be considered a small market, but at The Dove, we're excited about the opportunity to make a big impact right here in our community. And you help make that happen. Did you know that more than 90% of our income comes from people like you? You can help us now by making a secure online donation at our website, thedove.us, or by phoning 541-776-5368. Okay, we're back uh, with uh, Patrick Doyle from Veritas Counseling, and uh, you know we're touching nerves today, and uh, you and I will both get the emails and the calls. <laughs> and let me just I say so. uh, to our viewers and listeners, um, this whole show will be up on the Dove website uh, sometime late this afternoon or tomorrow, and the YouTube portion of it, you can take that and watch it again. Mm -hmm. And if you feel like it, send it to your friends. Just yeah. send the link to your friends and they can watch it. Yeah. If you know somebody that's suffering uh, with a lot of guilt and shame and how you can get them free. But I've always said, and we'll probably say it until the Lord takes me <laughs> home, and that is that whatever God saves you from or brings you through is usually what he turns you around and makes you a minister to. Yeah. We want to know what your ministry is? Look, we're... You've come. Right. It, it takes a school teacher to reach a school teacher, a yeah. truck driver to reach a truck driver, right. and so on. Right. And whatever rat hole you were pulled out of, there's a good chance God's <laughs> going to send you back in there to pull some other people out. So just kind of get ready for it. And um, that's why mm -hmm. it takes an addict to reach an addict. Mm -hmm. I think that's why Doug Gould's yeah. Foundation that's for right. Recovery is so successful. Yes, that's right. That's why he is successful. You were raised an uh, abusive dad. Yep. Your mom died on Christmas Day when you were 10. 10. Bah. And your dad <laughs> abused you, and and, um, and then that obviously led into addictions. Uh -huh. Smoking pot when I was 10. All right. Um, and you did the worldly sorrow. You actually fooled the church for a while. I did. I did. I fooled myself mostly. Okay. Um, what happened? At what point do you realize, wait a minute, there's a big gap from where I am and where I really need to be? Well, <laughs> This may, this may sound, you know, kind of crazy, but, you know, at 17, I made a profession of faith. Um, and I had been living with my sister earlier in my life. My sister uh, took me in, which basically saved my life. And for a year and a half, I lived with her. And after a year and a half, she was like, <laughs> you got to go. Yeah. It's <laughs> <That's laughs> a bad day when you're getting kicked out of a you're, family house. You're, so. you're killing us. So, yeah. you know, and she sent me back to my dad, which she knew was a bad deal, but... You know, they, could, they just couldn't handle me. I was just crazy. Uh, <clears throat> and I knew it was the best thing that ever happened to me to be there, but I couldn't take it. I couldn't, I just couldn't control myself. So went away with my dad for another year and a half. And then in that period of time while I was away, um, I, was live, I was living on my own at 16, uh, selling drugs, you know. You know, I was just doing my thing. And then uh -huh. my, sis my, my sister, um, in the meantime, while I was away, had, she had come to faith. And her husband had come to faith. And so they, had, they wanted me to come back and live with them. And it's a long story. I don't have time to tell it all. But so I get back here and I go to church with them and I make a profession of faith. Now, I'm still smoking pot. I'm still, I'm still a sinner. I'm still just doing everything I did the day before I got saved. I'm doing the day after I got saved. I didn't really like repent about a lot. I made some sort of profession. And then over time, 
I started getting involved in church and going to Bible studies and whatever, whatever, whatever. And I, I didn't stop smoking pot until I joined the military, mm-hmm. which was, you know, what I, when I was 18. And uh, so then I went to the military and I don't know, I'm 18, 19, 20, 21 in the military. What do you think I did? Uh, everything I, under the sun. I was a good kid. Yeah, Not right. really. Yeah. Um, and, and I was in Germany for a couple of years. Um, you know, that's a bad place for a young guy with money. Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, my conscience was not really fully formed at the point. Yeah. So, you know, but I was a Christian and I went to church and whatever. Long story short, about seven, I was uh, eight years into my Christian life. I was um, in full-time ministry with Youth for Christ. Um, I had been uh, sleeping with my girlfriend, and her dad was an elder in my church who was a really good guy, and you, you would know who he was. He had taken me in and been very kind to me, and he was so happy that I was dating his daughter because he was sure I was treating her right, but I really wasn't. I was, you know, terrible. And, but I had this veneer of being this good guy in ministry, and... My dad had just died a few months before, and um, I'm laying in my bed in this dank apartment that I had, which was, which is, which is, used, it's above what is now um, Gorilla Bites or that. It's oh. downtown. It was upstairs. This, you know, terrible piece of rat hole apartment. <laughs> and uh, so, I was. It was winter. It was dank outside. I had just moved in. I had a mattress on the floor, nothing on it, just a, no, no sheets, no nothing, boxes, you know. Place was cold. The heat didn't really work. I'm laying on my bed, and I'm basically begging God to kill me. Please, God. Just, it's, it's just better for everyone if you just take me out because I'm such a lying, hypocritical piece of work. Everybody thinks I'm this great Christian guy. I'm not a great Christian guy. I, I, I'm terrible. I'm lying to my kids at Youth for Christ. I'm lying to my boss. I'm lying to my girlfriend. I'm lying to her dad. I'm a liar. I'm a piece of junk. Just kill me. Wow. And so what God did was, and I cannot, I cannot explain to you how, but I know that I know it was. Mm-hmm. It was like God showed up, and I didn't hear a voice or see anything, but in my heart, it was like God said, oh, okay, Pat, let's take a look at your heart. And I'm like, uh, did you not hear what I just said? <laughs> Hello. I don't think that would be a good idea. Hello. That's a pretty dark place. And in my mind's eye, it's like he grabs hold of the door of my heart and like he pulls the door like a third of the way up and we both sort of lean our heads around <laughs> and look in there. And he says, you see that? And I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty well aware of that. And he's like, I've always known. Mm. And I just started sobbing at that point on my bed. And then he went further and he said, I will never leave or forsake you. And I will be your everlasting father. And then it was convulsive sobbing. Like if somebody would have had a camera on me, they'd have thought this guy is going to go to north. Mm. Um, but it was at that moment when my life changed. All that stuff before, it was all part of God's work to get me there. Right. But it was that moment, this is what I was talking about before, where I knew that I knew that I knew. All the sermons, all the books I read didn't really do to me what that moment. And this is, Eugene Peterson translates part of Hebrews where he says, no longer I'm going to write it on stone tablets. I'm now going to etch it or write it into the lining of their hearts. And so what happened to me at that moment was God etched his love into me. And it never has left since. And that is in the dark night of my soul, Perry. One of the things that I go back to. Mm -hmm. I know. I know that God knows. He spoke to me. It's undeniable to me. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. I know that to be true. And that is how I get back to the truth. (sighs) Okay, God, you do know. You do love me. And then it starts, then it's like dominoes start falling. It's like I have memories of, oh, yeah, you did that. And oh, yeah, that. No, because, yeah, no. And next thing I'm like, thank you, God, for being so good to me. You should kill me. But instead, you love me. I just want to uh, emphasize to those listening who struggle with guilt and shame and this inner turmoil Mm -hmm. to seek that encounter yourself. Yes. Uh, Because... um, until that happens, yeah. Christ and the Bible and mm-hmm. Christianity is all theoretical. Yeah. 
Exactly. And the moment it happens, right, all that changes. Yes, right. You know, right. And and because it's so real to me, Perry, it's why I don't get weirded out when I see people who don't understand it. Mm-hmm. I'm like, gosh, I, I I've been there. I've done that. I'll be there tomorrow, maybe. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. But I because I deeply know what it does is it gives me peace and freedom, and that's the thing I want people to see is that peace and freedom is not about organizing your circumstances or your situation in a way that's good right. because you can't do that you don't have the power controls a myth if we had control none of us would be here mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. it's about being loved and when i knew that i knew that i was loved that's what changed my life all right i don't know if we got enough time let me see if i can squeeze in one call hi sir you're on the air with patrick doyle go ahead quickly okay you know you get to be, you, if I read the gospel and I know the gospel, am I talking over him? We, we hear you. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, turn your radio down so I can hear that again. I got, I got the TV on just oh, like it. Oh, okay. All right, there. Yeah, there's a little bit of a delay and everything on that. Just talk to us through the phone. Okay, there you go. I'm sorry. Yeah, turn your radio down so I can hear that Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> All right. You asked a question a little while ago. Why do you why do you relapse? Yes. Well, I, I get that pounding in my head again. You know the paddle wheel. Yeah. And sometimes a person wants to get relief from that. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know. All right. What do you want to say to that? Patrick? Well, one of the main reasons why people end up in a situation where they're in a paddle wheel is they're alone. And when I mean alone, I don't mean that there's no one you know, maybe physically in proximity, no one knows what's going on inside of you. And so because of that secrecy, you're trapped. And then the cycle just repeats itself over and over and over again. And that's why I think one of the geniuses of what AA does or what Doug is doing is it's about connecting people to other people so that you can get honest about what's actually happening and you have actual support. So instead of being controlled by the desires to relapse, you have some place to go so somebody can help you not go there. Um, but that takes time and that's a process. It's not, it's not an event. And I think that's what a lot of us want is we want the magic pill, we want the magic wand. And I know from my own recovery that that's not what it is, it's a process. Um, and we got to stick to it as much as we can. But you're going to need help, and that means you can't be isolated. Okay, that's good Good advice. Well, uh, again, let me just uh, say to our viewers and listeners, uh, this has been a powerful hour, and uh, this will be available again up on the Dove website a little bit later on at the Dove.us, and you'll be able to take the, the YouTube portion of this, watch it again, and I would really recommend that you take that and forward that link on to someone that perhaps uh, you know needs this. But the bottom line is uh, you come to this realization. I, I, I think there's a lot of people listening and watching today that realize, wait a minute, I'm in an impasse. Yeah. And all of my theology yeah. and all of the sermons yeah. still won't break the code. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you and know. don't let that turn into there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Right. You okay. know, God but, isn't upset with you. Turn that into a seeking? Yes. Ask. God, please reveal yourself to me. I did it in a way that the only way I knew how was in deep pain. So I'm like, just kill me. <laughs> yeah. God didn't answer that prayer. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Instead, he did what he needed to do, which was to love me in a way that I knew that he was loving me. All right. Uh, Veritas Counseling, 5416 6 I always want to put another one in. 6226018. That's the number to his office. Yeah. And again, uh, reminding you that if you want to watch this again, check out the Dove website uh, later on this afternoon or in the morning. It'll be there for you. And then share this. Uh, send the link off to uh, some family and friends. Thanks, buddy. You bet. My Thanks pleasure. for your transparency you and bet. being there. We'll see you next time on Focus Today. I'm Jim, and I work at the Dub TV. Every weekday between 6 and 8 a.m., our award-winning news and sports team bring you the best morning show around. It's live, it's honest, and it's a whole lot of fun. And you help make it happen. Did you know that more than 90% of our income comes from people like you? You can help us continue to air local programs that share your voice by making a secure online donation at our website, thedub.us.